We'll be starting up here in a couple of minutes. Give folks just a second to finish logging on and then we'll uh, get her started. See my list of things to work on today. There we go. Okie dokie. And we got people signing in. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, one of our Y webinars, our foundational webinars, trying to help you with the basics of stuff. Today we're going to be talking about guide rail. My name is David Orr. I'm the director here with the uh, LTAP Center here in New York State, the Cornell Local Roads Program. Hope everybody's having a good day and didn't get washed out too much by the rain last night. Now, you're probably wondering why I got a picture that doesn't have any guide rail on it. Guide rail? I'll come back to that. Guide rail is actually one of the last things that we do. So we'll talk about that. There is a handout. If you open up your chat pod, you'll be able to get a link to the handout. If you can't access that for some reason, just email us um, and we'll take care of it from that standpoint. Okay. Now, the this webinar is uh, one of seven more that we've got over the course of the summer. Uh, we're going to be doing bridge basics and shop safety in July. We only have a couple of weeks because we've got the holiday coming up next week and then uh, we're doing a training class on ADA, so we are going to compete with ourselves. We do need folks to sign up, so if you could sign up for that ADA class, it's in three locations around the state, uh, Schenectady County, I think Cayuga, and Ulster, if I got it, my brain remembered right, but by magic of no hands, uh, Amanda and Jody, who are helping me out, will throw the link so you can register yourself in the chat box. Now, before we get going on too far here, uh, just as a reminder for those who haven't been on one of these in a while or even brand new, uh, your audio settings are down the lower left. There is a chat pod. We do recommend you open it because that's where we're going to put links to the handouts and help you out with the polls that we're going to be doing, things like that. But it's one way. We send stuff to you. If you want to send us questions, open up the Q&A pod. That's where we'll look for questions from you. In fact, we'll actually take some answers at a couple of places using that rather than using the poll EV just because the technology works better. And then we may ask you to raise your hands now and then. So just as a way to check to see how everybody's doing, go ahead and raise your hand. Let's see how that works. See if everybody can raise your hand. Cool. Okay, and then Amanda has, or Jody has thrown in the engineering class registration online. So you can sign up for that. And hopefully, we'll see you in uh, July and August. So, okay, and then we'll magically lower all the hands and we'll get started here. Okay. Now, this particular one is worth uh, professional development hours here in New York State. It's one PDH. Okay. That's only for the person registered, so you can't duplicate for this particular thing. We'll give you certificates if you let us know ahead, but for PDHs, you got to be the person registered. It's counted as a course. Um, what will happen is you send us your certificate of attendance, and then uh, we'll send you out the PDH for that. Now, if you're from another state, uh, you'll need to check with your LTAP center, so we'll take care of it there. Now, Let's do a little bit of a welcome and let's talk a little bit about where you're from. That helps me out as we're talking today. So we have some polls coming up. We're going to be using pollev.com and that's slash David Orp for today's polls. Again, if you open up your chat pod, 
there'll be a link so you have to type it in. But let's just get a sense of where you're from and who you're with. So who do you work for? Do you work for a town, a county, a city or village, state or federal, the weekend, tribal, or a contractor? Let's see what we got today. Uh, we've got county, we've got state and federal, consultants, city, village, one town, and two people who work for the weekend. Well, always good to have those honest folks on. Cool. Okay, that helps me a bit. So mix of county and state is the majority, but we have a whole variety of folks. That's good. What is your job? Are you an administrator, superintendent, or DPW commissioner, an engineer? Are you in the field crew? Are you a crew supervisor? Are you a supervisor, mayor, or an elected official, or just a board member? And again, we'll see. I'm suspecting mostly engineers today, but we'll see. Okay, a lot of engineers, a lot of none of the above. If you put in none of the above, let me know your title in the Q&A pod, then, just so I get a sense of uh, what your title is. And then we have one member of a field crew and a couple of highway superintendents. Okay, good to Salesperson. Okay. What do you sell? Sell, Tom. Maybe tell me what you sell. That might help too. And then uh, where are you from? This is a cool one because you get to click on the map. You can click on the map where you're from. If you're not from New York, you could put the approximate location where you're located. But uh, ah, we have that person who's from the middle of the lake. Ah, road inspection software. Okay, cool. So we have one person swimming in Lake Ontario. We don't have a lot of guide rail in uh, Lake Ontario, but uh, quite a variety. This is nice. I like to see this. Okay. So all over New York State, and we don't have anybody from out of the state except maybe that person who's a swimmer. Today. Now, we've talked about traffic safety. We do a lot of traffic safety stuff. Um, and you've probably seen this particular slide before. And... Uh, it's an interesting graphic. What it reminds us of is that a lot of what we're dealing with is human factors, but there's still an awful lot of things we can do as highway people and dealing with the roadway itself. And where does guide rail fit in all this? Well, think about how the humans behave because obviously what we're trying to do is avoid crashes. We want people to walk away safely. And again, we'll spend a lot of time in other sessions talking about keeping people on the roadway and traffic safety and stuff like that. But really, when you think about it, start at the beginning before you go directly to rail and let's look at the roadside hazards themselves. Then let's talk about what are the treatment options? Is it even worth doing anything? And then and only then do we think about choosing the correct rail. Way too often we just, uh, let's go put rail up when actually there may be other things we should be thinking about first. And then we'll end our hour together, putting it all together. Uh, that'll be our quiz, but it'll also be more of a case study where you get to go through and help figure out what would you do for a particular site. Now, I'm talking in general for guide rail today. This is foundational stuff, but things do change depending on the road type. So if you, for instance, had a roadway that was really low volume, um, low volume roads uh, from AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, they talk about relatively low clear zones and relatively narrow roadways and shoulders. And in those cases, you may not need rail at all. The risk is actually such that it might be better to put rail last. And we'll talk a little bit about that. If you're more interested, by the way, in more details on low volume road standards, that engineering link for the ADA session coming up in July also includes a link to a class we're doing on low volume roads at the beginning of August. So let's talk about roadside hazards, and this is where you can help me. Let's see what you think some roadside hazards are. So put this in to your, uh, the polls in here. You can join via poll, ev.com, and you can put in your questions. What are some roadside hazards? Okay. And I'm going to pull the responses up and at least see what you come up with. Trees, headwalls, debris, embankments, uh, water, streams, holes, okay. Animals, yeah. It'd be hard to put rail up for animals. I don't know how that would work. But. Ditches, yeah, that's a good one. Lights, culverts, mailboxes, okay. Now, actually, I'm really glad to see that our number one thing we put 
is the number one thing we got to worry about when we're leaving the roadway and all kinds of things we have to deal with. So let's talk a little bit about some of these. By far the biggest issue we have to deal with is trees, okay? About half of all fatalities that occur where people leave the roadway is because they hit a tree, okay? But trees in them themselves are not really the issue. It's poorly placed trees or poorly protected trees or trees that really aren't where they belong. The one on the right there, for instance, has obviously been hit. It actually narrows the roadway up. We may need to think about doing something when we let a tree get in front of the wall, okay? And then, of course, if we're going to put rail up, we want to make sure the rail is actually doing the job correctly, because if it isn't, it actually might make things worse. So trees are, yes, our number one thing. One thing you didn't list in your thing, but it's actually a roadside issue. It's a major one, and it makes rail useless if you've got this almost, and that is edge drop-offs, especially around the corners, but even along a straight stretch of highway, vehicle goes off the edge. It's a safety issue, and you may want to think about doing some improvements for the safe edge to make it more likely that people don't run off into the rail or off the road and hit the fixed objects along the side. Keeping people in the lane and giving them recovery is really important. We talked about walls and cuts and embankments. Uh, slopes, of course, are a consideration that we have to worry about. We certainly wouldn't want to go off the side of this roadway, okay? But let's think about what priorities we have and where we're going to put our bang for our buck. Y'all mentioned water, rivers, and streams. I took this from standing on a culvert, and yes, that is a pumpkin in the middle of the row of the stream. I'm not sure why there's a pumpkin there, but something to keep in mind. But the idea is you've done a good job of listing the kind of road hazards we have to deal with. And some of the things we place in the roadway. I mean, here's some mail, a mailbox, uh, gang mailbox that might not be doing the job. So it's something we need to be thinking about because we're probably not going to protect this with rail. So we have to think about things that aren't protected with rail. Are they crash worthy? Are they safe? You know, if we've got a situation where we're putting up signs and poles and rail itself. We're putting a fixed object in the roadway. We're putting something that could be dangerous in the roadway. So here's a crash test of a single post, just a small pipe, no big deal, right? But when it gets struck by a small car, it can lead to a very serious crash. You know, we really want things that are breakaway in a lot of ways. So long before we think about rail, we need to realize that vehicles, when they leave the roadway, if they hit something, we really want people to walk away. That's the goal. And yeah, they can be these big, heavy ones you see on the interstate, but they can be light. This particular one is essentially a single bolt holding that sign and it just flies away. And in a rural area, that can be just fine. So let's think about the fixed objects that are along the roadway itself. Signs, you know, we have to have signs for communication with the public, but signs become a hazard if we don't do them properly. Like if we've got these two posts real close together, now someone hits it, it doesn't fail properly, it doesn't shear, those posts are way too high. Now we've actually put a fixed object in the roadway, rail or nowhere. And something to keep in mind, remember, anything above four inches that isn't breakaway is no longer really shouldn't be in the roadway with any kind of speed. Anything above four inches could snag a small car, could help a car flip. So really everything above four inches, want to cut it down. And so obviously that means trees. If we need to remove the tree, we really want to cut it all the way down completely. Y'all mentioned poles. They do make breakaway poles, but very unlikely going to see that on most of our local systems. It's just hard to justify. But can we place the poles in such a place where they're less likely to get struck. And then of course, a rail, and we'll spend most of our time to, together talking about rail systems. A good rail system works. Poor rail system can actually make things worse, okay? Now, in terms of fixed object tra crashes, as I said, about half of all fatalities, 48%, if you wanna be technical about it, are because we've hit a tree or a shrub or a, a large, vegetative object. Anything above about four inches could cause the vehicle to crash and sh kill people. So really get rid of your trees. And that's true even for low speed roads. They're surprisingly dangerous if they're in the wrong spot. That doesn't mean I want you to cut down all the trees. And we'll talk about that quite a bit. 
we got to worry about our signs and our poles that we put in. About 17% of those fixed object crashes are when we hit things we put in the roadway. Uh, there are other fixed objects that we hit that we put in the roadway, and that includes our rail systems. Okay. There are barriers uh, that we put in. And then, of course, there's those things we can't do much about, like the slopes and stuff like that. That's surprisingly low. Okay. And yes, they're both labeled other fix. It's just I took all the details off, so it wasn't up on the screen so much. Now, you've heard the term clear zone, and in our some of our other webinars, we've defined the clear zone for folks. But essentially, the concept is if you can get a clear zone, a minimum width, you don't have to worry about rail. You don't have to worry about too much unless you got a long slope that people might go down. So give people a recovery width so they don't hit things. And that's really the issue when it comes to trees and poles and those things we have in the near the roadway is, is there enough clear zone? Is there enough basic recovery for vehicles? Now, if you're wondering about clear zones, this is a table out of the New York State Highway Design Manual, which is adapted from the Ashto Roadside Design Guide. And I know every one of you is going, Dave, it's too small. It's okay. You don't need to remember any of this. This is a table 10-1 in the Highway Design Manual, which is linked in the handout is available to you. And if you haven't downloaded it, open up your chat pod and you'll have a handout that lists some references, including to the Astros Roadside Design Guide and the New York State Highway Design Manual and some other charts that we'll be talking about later on. Now, one thing to remember, if you have an existing roadway that does not have a history of crashes and it's low volume, just maintain the existing zone, but make sure it's consistent, okay? Don't just go cutting trees back. You really don't need to if it's a low volume roadway. Maintain the existing width. Improve where you've got concerns about problems and where there's inconsistencies, where a tree is not in line with the other trees or it's sitting in the wrong location. And we'll talk about a few examples of that. You don't need to go crazy and you improve it during construction. You upgrade things as you can, have a plan. In fact, I usually tell folks before you put any rail system up, you really want to plan for your entire community because if you put rail in spot A, later on the crash occurs in spot B and you didn't have a plan, that actually exposes you to some liability. So really look at your whole system before you start putting rail systems up. So right here, uh, do you see any issues? Uh, can anybody see any issues? You want to throw that in the Q&A for me and tell me if you see an issue here? See what y'all put in the Q&A. Tree stumps. Oh, somebody can see the tree stumps. That's good. Okay. Yeah. A little, little hard to see in the grass, but uh, we'll blow the picture up. And sure enough, over on the left side there, those tree stumps, they cut the trees down, but then they left the tree stumps. And yes, Somebody mentioned the grass growing. So as that grass grows up, it hides that fixed object. You can't see it. And you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to go into the grass and you're going to have a really bad day. So remember, if you are working on your clear zone and your roadside, have consistency and make sure there's nothing that could snag somebody that they wouldn't anticipate. I don't want you to leave a dangerous tree, but I also really don't want you to leave a dangerous stump. They're almost more dangerous than the full tree, because I know at least I'm going to hit a tree. There's nothing I can do if it's something I'm not aware of. OK, so we've done a good job talking about the obstacles on the side of the roadway. So let's talk about treating those obstacles. OK, you know, what do we do? You know, we see a nice, it's a pretty looking mailbox, but boy, I'm not sure I want to hit that with a car. Um, but let's talk about our treatment options. There's an order to treatment options. Everybody wants to just go straight to rail. But this is the order that the FHWA has. And there's a small modification we'll talk about for low volume roads. But essentially, remove the hazard, make the hazard traversable. You can drive over it. Relocate it away from where it can be struck. If it has to be there, make it crash worthy. Then shield it. Think about the rail systems or the barriers of some type. And then finally delineate it. Now, 
for a low volume road, those last two may get flipped. And we'll talk a little bit about that, that it may actually be better to just start with delineation before shielding. But in either case, those are still the last two things we think about doing. And as a short term, until you can get up and do shielding, delineation is a lot of times a real good short term until I can get back there and do a longer term fix. So keep these things in mind. So let's go through this list and talk about this a little bit. So removing the hazard. Here's a perfect example. There used to be a ditch here. The ditch was uh, four or five feet deep. And if you drove into it, you could have a really bad day. So what they did was they piped everything and they put in catch basins and grates. And now it's completely traversable. So they've removed the hazard. So the clear zone width is complete. And there's nothing in that that somebody strikes that's going to cause the vehicle to go stop. So they've removed the hazard. And that's really the first thing. If we can, let's remove the hazard. OK, get rid of the hazards that we have. You can make that hazard traversable. Now, on the left is a number eight rebar, one inch diameter, 25 millimeters for those who care, uh, on a one foot or 300 millimeter grid placed on top of the end of a culvert. The whole purpose of that is to eliminate the need for rail if you can get to it. But you can see the rocks in advance. You really couldn't get to that particular rail uh, remover, essentially the protector there. You'll see these on uh, state highways and the interstate. In fact, now that you've seen it, you'll see them as you drive around. They're actually pretty cool, but they need to be on top. So then in a storm event, you can yank them out of the way. If you want something more uh, elaborate, they make things specifically to go in the end of culvert pipes that are either horizontal or vertical. And we could spend a lot of time talking about things that make things more traversable. But the idea here is if a vehicle goes off, it goes over the top. And again, people walk away from the crash. Even if it does damage to the vehicle, we'll trade property damage for injuries and fatalities any day. And here's an example where it looks like there's not much bad here. This is along an interstate. And you see that little head wall down there. That head wall is not very high. It's only about eight inches. But that eight inch head wall, as you can see, sadly, led to six fatalities because person didn't see it. They hit that, it caused a rollover and multiple fatalities. Now that's a high speed interstate type of situation, but we all know of places where there's a head wall sticking up. And if we had just extended the pipe out and maybe put a cover over the end or go out far enough where we don't have to have even rail, everybody would have been better off and be a lot cheaper in the long run. And what value did we put on a human life? And one of the biggest places we have problems is we're on the local system is ditches. Ditches are not real traversable. Short, shallow ditches that are steep, you hit them, you're likely to lose control if you got high speed. So it's something to think about, maybe flattening and widening our ditches, putting those grates on the end of the driveway so that if a vehicle hits it, it goes up over the top. And again, we'll trade property damage for injuries. But in this case, it was high speed in the vehicle, as you can tell, rolled. Okay. Our next step is to relocate the object. So we've removed it. We've made it traversable. If we can't do those things, relocate it. You know, if you've got utility poles, don't let the utility pole be in the ditch. It really should be back up on top of the slope. Okay. So in the Q&A, tell me, what do you think about this uh, situation? What do you think about those utility poles? What would you do in that particular case? Let's see what somebody comes up with in the Q&A here. Nobody's giving me an answer. They're having their coffee, Amanda. Yep. Leave the poles and move them further out. Yeah. Surprisingly, actually, in some cases, you actually might be better to put them a little closer. This is a pretty flat ditch, so people have pretty good control. But imagine if it's a relatively steep ditch, they get stuck right in the bottom. When vehicles go off the road, especially if it's a drowsy driver who falls asleep, they actually tend to go down to the low spot and they go straight along that low spot. And so now if you're anything within the width of the vehicle, you're going to hit that pole. And so if you just move that back to where the uh, white Crits Farm sign is, would be enough room for the vehicle to miss 
that particular pole or to even move it up the slope. Uh, not normally done, but something to think about. Don't put utility poles in the bottom of a ditch line. That's a risky place to have them. You can make your roadside more crashworthy, okay? So for instance, here's a good example of a gang mailbox. We saw one earlier that wasn't gonna work. Here's one that actually works pretty well, okay? The idea behind this is everything's attached together. When it hits the vehicle's hood, it just yanks and pulls out of the ground. And again, some property damage, but everybody walks away. And I, I had not seen one in New York, but recently they've been doing some work just to the east of Ithaca. And in that particular site, I was walking along one of my morning hikes and there's a perfect example. There's one along uh, Route 366 in Varna near Ithaca here. Where again, if a vehicle comes along and it hits that gang mailbox, rather than going into the vehicle or creating a serious crash, that thing actually is literally gonna just pull up, and be knocked out of the way. So something to think about if you've got gang mailboxes, put something that's designed to be struck. Because likely at some point, one of the ones along this stretch is gonna get struck when somebody's distracted on their phone, tired, whatever. Now, we're finally getting to shielding. We're finally talking about rail. And we'll talk a lot, a lot more about rail later on. But the idea is we're just now, almost halfway through, talking about rail systems. Because again, we want to do all these other things first if we can possibly do so economically. Because there's a cost to rail. And as we mentioned earlier, rail in of itself is a fixed object. And then finally, you can delineate. Okay. If you can't do anything else, if the economics don't work out, and again, in the short term, you can put up signs and delineation. Though, of course, you don't want to make sure all the signs are pointing in the right direction. Here's what happens when a single bolt fails. One of the signs is out of sorts. But delineate. Now, I mentioned earlier the fact that we may sometimes flip that order a little bit. On a really low volume road, risk-wise, it may actually be better to just delineate. I mean, this is a roadway that has a grand total of maybe 50 vehicles a day. It might actually be risk-wise okay to just delineate. I would delineate, but you may not need to do any more than that because the chances of someone going off versus the cost of the rail system is on that balancing act. And that around 400 vehicles a day is where that actually starts to become uh, true from a risk standpoint. If you get the Astro Low Volume Design Guide, uh, it actually talks about that risk level for rail systems. At that point, it may actually be more risky to put rail systems up than to leave them. But again, think about exposure and think about severity. This is a really high slope. So maybe we put some rail in some of the worst places. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, I don't need to do it in order, but let's just think about what are the steps for dealing with roadside hazards. And I'll let you do this one via the whole EV. Let's see how you guys do. Okay, I'm going to let you put in your answers for dealing with the roadside hazards, and let's see if we got all of them. Okay, so let's uh, let you put those in, and I'm not going to show you the results for just a second. So let's see how we do, and I'll pop over and see how we did. And there should be seven. I'll give you that much. There should be seven different things that we can do, and we'll talk. Remind you of the order in just a minute. Okay, let's see what we got. Remove. Okay, that's good. Identify. We should identify. That's true. Remove. Someone got removed. There's seven steps. We got one so far. If you have a problem dealing with the uh, whole EV, just put it in the Q&A. I can pull it off the Q&A too. Relocate. Yep. Okay, so we got remove. We got relocate. We got shield. So we got three. Make traversable four. Eliminate or remove, okay. I like the fact you all start with remove, delineate, we got five. Okay, pretty good, nice job. Okay, let's go see how we did, okay. So our steps, it's actually six. Brain dead this morning, need more coffee. So remove, make traversable, relocate, make crashworthy, shield, and delineate, okay? So good job. And again, 
that's the order we like to look at, though sometimes we'll flip those bottom two on a low volume roadway. And in short term, we may just delineate, okay? So let's choose the correct rail. Now we've got our situation. We, we can't remove it. We can't make it traversable. We can't relocate it. We can't make it crash worthy. So now let's talk about shielding, choosing the correct guide rail. Now, if you're in New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut, you call it guide rail. And all of us that were on today mentioned you were in New York. But if you're in another state, you may hear the term guardrail. It's the same stuff, okay? It's essentially a ribbon that acts like a big rubber band if it's done well. So let's talk about the types of rail systems that are out there. Let's talk a little bit about the deflection that you need because it is a big rubber band. We're going to spend just a second or two on uh, the point of need. Where do you actually start and end the rail system? And then do you need a length of the system run out so you, vehicles can't get in behind and hit the problem? And of course, in sections make a huge difference. So we'll talk about these things. Now, how does guide rail work? Again, it's a big rubber band. It's just made out of metal. So watch the truck as it runs along and it hits a cable system, which is the highest deflection system. And watch this just a rubber band. Pulls the vehicle right back to the roadway. So it hit it at a high speed, high angle, and yet people would walk away. There would just be property damage. So that's how rail works. That means it has to have a good end to build up that rubber band, that tension. It has to have the ability to not hit something when vehicles deflect. Let me go back and watch that deflection distance again. Watch how far that vehicle goes in. If there was a fixed object in that space, it would hit the fixed object, it would actually direct it, okay? So these are all important considerations. So if you've got a rail system that is not gonna have the proper deflection distance, doesn't have the proper ends to build up that ability to take the load, you're gonna have a really bad day, okay? Now this is a low speed roadway. It's probably gonna be okay if someone hits it, but boy, I don't wanna have that. I, I, I would either just have some delineation. If I can't put up a proper rail, you're almost better to put delineation up that, or some other shielding type systems like sand cushions or something. Um, rail really needs to be a long segment. And we know that's a challenge in lake roads and places where there's a lot of driveways, that can be a challenge. Now, the most common rail systems we use, obviously we have cable rail as the most deflection. We like that here in New York. Uh, weak post W beam, box beam. Again, New York likes a lot of box beam. You could do a heavy post W beam that's with a block out. We'll show you a video and explain why we want the block outs on there. And then of course, you could go all the way up to concrete half sections or walls, um, which have zero deflection to. Cable is really common. People like cable systems. They're open, they're a little cleaner, but they do require more maintenance. Cable systems, you know, if we had a whole day together, we talk a lot about the cable system. They usually have a turnbuckle and you gotta have the ability for them to keep their tension. Otherwise they don't really do the job. And as you can see in this case around the corner, it's actually pulling those posts in a little bit. So something to be aware of. But if you can't get the length of the cable system and you don't keep the tension up, and everything sags, it's not really going to do the job. You're not going to get any kind of rubber band effect in this particular case. In fact, if anything, you're going to go over the top of the rail in that one little spot that's over on the right side there. So again, I like cable, but from a maintenance standpoint, it does have some maintenance. You do have to go back and check the tension. If you don't think you can do that, you may want to go up to the next grade to a WRL system or something heavier, okay? We like the lightest rail we can get away with, but you have to be able to maintain what you put up. There's a W, uh, weak post W beam systems, okay? And we'll talk about the fact that there's some issues with that one on the left, but these are the things we're all familiar with. We see that simple W rail, sometimes a tri rail, but mostly commonly those with bridges. But those W rail, again, it's a big rubber band. And if you don't have the ability to build that up, you're gonna have a problem with it. You could go up to box beam, uh, boxing is a little bit stiffer, okay? It's a tubular system. Uh, some people like it just because it looks. Um, it does, it's a nice stiff system, does a pretty good job. But of course, if it's stiff, it also has the ability to launch vehicles in the air. And then of course, heavy post systems with the blockouts behind them. The purpose for the blockouts is so vehicles don't snag. This particular failure that you see, by the way, is not because of the 
rail system itself, it's the end system. Someone actually hit the end and the vehicle literally got speared at the end. So the best system in the world doesn't do any good if it is not a system. An end, a middle, and another end to hold that rubber band together. Now, illustrating what this, uh, these systems do, here's a video of what is known as MASH, which is the current standard for testing on a two-on-one slope with lockouts. And as you can see, it does a pretty good job at a high speed test. Yeah, it did some damage to the vehicle, but watch carefully in the slow motion version. You can see the blockouts keep things from snagging as the post push away. It keeps the thing in position so it doesn't twist too much. The wooden blocks did bend a little bit, but by the time they did, the post were out of the way and the vehicle could keep going. Now these days we can use wood, but to be honest, the plastic blockouts are much more common. I like them because they have a lip. Watch the car. <clears throat> sure, that vehicle is not drivable. It's probably total, but that is a crash where people can walk away. For these systems to work, You've got to put them in the right location. This is right on the edge of the slope. And if you've got a well-maintained slope, it works. But if you don't have that soil support, that rail system isn't going to do the job. When someone hits it, rather than bending and pulling the vehicle back, the vehicle is either going to go underneath, the system isn't going to provide the proper resistance, it's going to deflect too much. There's a lot of reasons why this is a bad system. We've got to have that soil support. Again, it's an overall system. Now you could go all the way up to a concrete half section, like you'll see on the interstate with an embankment or a bridge, things like that. Those were great, they have zero deflection, but of course that means if someone hits them, that is zero deflection. And the stiffer the system, the more damage it's gonna put back into a vehicle. So we want the lightest system that we can maintain. And just as a reminder, Let's talk about that deflection distance, because this is one of the most important considerations for which rail system we're going to choose. So here's a picture of a W rail in front of a tree. Okay, shortly after this picture was taken, the tree was removed. Shortly after that, there was a crash. A vehicle hit the rail system. But instead of hitting the tree, it actually just deflected. So walk away crash. You don't want anything fixed within that deflection distance, okay? Because if someone hits it, it actually can help direct a vehicle into the tree. So really, when you're thinking about rail systems, make sure you've got that deflection distance. So let's ask a simple question. What rail systems have a deflection of less than five feet? If you had, you couldn't move the object, you couldn't remove the object, okay? So you a tree you can't remove because whatever, or it's a utility pole or something that has to be there, or it's a, a very steep slope, the, the wall, you don't want to deflect that much. What rail systems have less than five feet? Box beam, people can come up with answers, but I'm a big fan. I don't remember off the top of my head, but that's the reason we like references and handouts. So we, in the handout you've got on the second page, we actually listed the deflection distances for different rail systems. So as you can see, cable, not so much. Weak post, if it has enough post, a very tight spacing can actually be less than five feet. Box beam, most box beams do, and of course, heavy post and uh, concrete do a good job. So the idea is you don't have to memorize these things. You can look them up, okay? So yeah, weak, less than four foot spacing, box beam, heavy post, and concrete. This is quite a few systems if you need to go less than five. But again, if you can, put the lightest rail system up that you can, that you can maintain. Now, this is something called the point of need. And again, you're going, Dave, I can't read it. It's too small, okay? So, okay, that's when we have the handout. Go look in the handout. And as you're looking at the handout, let me explain what the point of need is. The idea is simple, okay? So let's imagine here's a rail system that 
it should be probably a little bit longer. Okay, and we'll talk more about the end section in a little bit. Um, but really, if you think about it, the point of need is if a vehicle goes off the road, we don't want it to hit some fixed object. So we need to have the rail system starting far enough away so that the vehicle at that angle doesn't hit the fixed object. And that distance is defined with some lovely geometry as r times 1 over the tangent of 15 degrees. And I don't think I remember the tangent of 15 degrees, but I can remember the number 4. So if you just round it up a little bit, that distance is about 4 times r. So you go to your rail face, and you look at what you're trying to protect. In this case, the back side of that tree. As we say, we don't want to remove that tree, and that's what we're trying to protect. So that's the back side of the tree. So that's four times R, and if that's about eight feet, you would actually need to come 32 feet down the roadway to actually start your rail to protect that particular tree, okay? So you need to come back and start the rail so the vehicle can't get off and at an angle hit that fixed object. So that's the point of need. So here's an example. We saw this one earlier. Yeah, it's the same picture, I just flipped it. And let's say that we can get rid of the first tree, the one that's real close to the front of the rail. It's inside the deflection distance. Let's say we can remove that one, but for reasons we can't remove the one in the back. Okay? But it's now still inside the deflection distance. Or excuse me, it's outside the deflection distance. We got enough distance if we got a post spacing right. It's close. But that rail is not starting soon enough. If a vehicle goes off the roadway, it's going to hit that tree. So how far down the road do we need to start our rail system? And by the way, it's seven feet. Okay, so if it's seven feet, someone in the Q&A, tell me how far down the road should that rail system have actually started if it really wanted to protect that tree for a vehicle going down the road? 28 feet. Yeah. Now, if you want to be technical about it, it's 26.2. If you do the actual math of one divided by the tangent of 15, but 28 feet is close enough. <laughs> I can do that. So again, you actually would have wanted to start the actual rail system 28 feet down the road, and that's not counting the end section. That's 28 feet of the rail itself. Any end sections need to go up even a little bit further. Okay. Now, the other thing, though, we sometimes actually have the rail longer than even for the point of need because of what's called the runout length. Depending on what we're trying to protect, if it's a fixed object, point of need matters. But if it's something like a slope or a water body, we actually need to run the rail out so that the vehicle gets behind it, it has time to stop before it goes over the drink or into the water. Okay, so in this particular case, we'll just do a figure of this. So imagine we have a stream. And what could happen if a vehicle gets behind the rail, it needs time for it to stop. Okay, that's the run out length. So in this particular case, obviously the run out length could be a little bit better. Does it have to meet an exact standard? Well, it'd be nice, but boy, there's actually space there. They could have extended it out quite a bit and protected quite a bit of that slope. In fact, that's actually why they're, they're talking about it, that why didn't they extend it? What kind of run out lengths do you need? Well, it depends on the roadway speed. For a high speed situation, you got a cross stream, you're gonna need a lot of distance. 360 feet is what they would like to have. With a lower speed, a lot of our rural roads, 260, and a low volume road, low speed road, 165 feet. Get what you can get where you are. So in this particular case, we've got a stream. We don't want a vehicle to get behind the rail and go into the stream. So what would be the runout length we would need? And let's assume it's a relatively low speed. And I'll go back one slide. I'll let you all put in the q and I'll give you the chart. But it is on the handout. What kind of runout length would you need in a low speed situation? 165, very good, yeah. Don't need a lot of distance. And again, get what you can. And by the way, that runout length is the same no matter what rail system you've got. So if you can't get the runout length, then you may need to think about going to the bank so your vehicle can't get behind the rail like you see in here. And let's spend a little bit of time on end sections. And, uh, the left, bad end section, the right, better end section, okay? The idea is hitting the end of the rail system is one of the most dangerous things. It can spear vehicles we saw earlier. 
you could anchor it in the back slope. The big thing there is if it, the post gets too high and a vehicle goes along, it can actually go under the rail. So in this case, a little bit too high. We have a maximum and minimum height we want on the rail system. So something like this is a little bit better. We sweep it outside the clear zone. It's a nice consistent distance. If the vehicle goes off, it's gonna hit that rail, okay? Now you could use a turn down end and we see a lot of these but these are only for downstream ends or low, low speed, like in the middle of a village or something like that. Because you get any kind of speed at all, those turn down ends, they look great, but doesn't take too much. Okay. Which way do you turn down? I'm going to turn off the sound, but I will keep the video going here. Let me get the video off. Um, so watch carefully this vehicle as we're going along here. This is a, just a standard twist, a Texas twist it's called in the video. Okay, watch what happens when a vehicle hits it. Doesn't look too bad, right? Here we go. It actually launches the vehicle over the top, okay? And you don't really want that. You really want the system to just fail out of the way and let people go behind it in that run out length or down the slope if it's a safe slope with good clear zones. The end section needs to fail in a controlled manner. So we really don't want to use those turn down ends on our high speed approach sections. Really try to avoid those. Those are older systems so we want to remove them. By the way, think about having the job of crash testing this stuff. It'd be pretty cool. But in terms of crash with the terminals, you don't have to memorize this. Again, look in the highway design manual, the state approved list. Federal Highway has an approved list. Um, there's tons of them out there. Just make sure when you put it in, put it in correctly. And essentially what it's doing is it's anchoring our rubber band. Okay, so watch carefully the video and watch what happens when the vehicle hits it. See how it pulls? You can see everything going into tension. So when it's hit anywhere to the left of that second heavy post, the rail works just as if it were in full length. It's essentially a rubber band, okay? I'll show that one more time. Watch how the vehicle, when it hits, everything pulls together, which means the installation of these is absolutely critical. So here's an example of one that sadly uh, was not done well. And you can see because it wasn't detached, the vehicle went right through the rail system and it led to a serious crash because the system didn't work properly. If it had been struck at the very end, it's supposed to fail out of the way, but anything beyond that second post, it should have acted just like it was a full rail system and it didn't in this particular case, it didn't do the job. So make sure you, if you're gonna put an in section up, you put it in correctly. And a lot of the failures that we've seen is because people didn't install them within the specs and the standards. Don't chance on the bolts. Don't use anything but the manufacturer's bolts. Do it right. Some other concerns, things to think about if you are putting rail systems up where there are sidewalks and curbs, be just realize if someone hits a curb system, they can vault and just go up and over the top. Okay, so you may want to think about a different or higher or a different style of rail. A lot of times in bridges, that's one of the reasons we actually like those higher rail systems. If someone does vault, they'll still hit the rail system. Um, when you are approaching a bridge, you really want to transition between the lighter rail and the bridge itself, or you're going to really have a bad day. This actually directed the crash vehicle right into the concrete rail on the bridge and made it worse. And we'll go back and do that again. Watch what happens. Lighter rail and directed it right in and what made what might have been a walkaway crash into something much more serious. And we've seen all kinds of things like this where you know vehicle hits that rail, it's actually gonna be directed into that bridge abutment. We really wanna gradually increase the stiffness and there's lots of standards. We don't have to go invent the wheel. But as you're looking at your system, plan on going in, updating your system and replacing it. All of these systems, or out of date, either as a approach system or even just a standard rail. Um, that old cable rail, that attachment at the end, ooh, someone hits that, that's a fixed object. So the rail itself might be fine and there's a nice turnbuckles to help hold it in place. 
but boy, if they hit that, they're going to have a really, really bad day. And so you really want to transition and upgrade your systems, update and replace. And by the way, that's the reason we want to have inspection and asset management programs. Uh, Jeff Scott, uh, our technical assistant engineer, was out looking at roadway issues, and he came across this. And that's pretty severe. You can see the rail has fallen down, the poster in the air, the wall is completely collapsed. It's not going to do the job. And yet the only reason he caught it, because he just had that little bit of an instinct, and driving down the road, it just didn't quite look just right over there on the right. So you need to start getting out doing inspections and keep looking for things. And we should be doing it on a regular basis. Uh, here's one that Jeff found that's probably a little bit out of date. That single cable hasn't been around since long before I was in the industry. Uh, so, you know, probably long before I was born. In fact, that cable had been there so long, you can see the anchor point is a tree. Because that's where it's uh, essentially grown around the cable. So we can do better than that, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we've gone through, we've really covered the basics of real. We can't get into a lot of the design aspects, but again, that's not the goal with today. The goal is to help you understand the foundational stuff with rail systems. We wanna make sure we remove what we can do, relocate it and all that fun stuff. So let's put it all together. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a series of Sykes, and that's photographs. I'll admit photographs is never going to be as good as if you're actually out there. But there are all seven choices now. The seventh choice, there is seven choices. The seventh is to do nothing, okay? That's always a choice. But in this case, are we going to remove the fixed hazard or the hazard? Are we going to make it traversable? Are we going to relocate it, make it crashworthy, shield it, delineate it, or do nothing. And remember, that's the order. We start at the top, we work our way down to the bottom, though I'll admit sometimes do nothing winds up being what we can afford short term. But long term, that's really the last choice. If we can do all those others, we will do them first. Okay, so we're going to go through. I'm going to use the Q&A for that. And I want to see three or four answers and we'll move on to each one. Okay, so let's uh, see how y'all do. So here's our first one. See what y'all think. And if you remember what I said earlier. Delineate. We got to delineate. Let's see. We got to delineate. Maybe a do nothing. Delineate. Shield. I can, okay. I'm okay with someone thinking I need to start thinking about shielding it. If you don't know the volume of traffic on this roadway. This is the one that had the really, really low volume traffic. Um, as a minimum, I would really want to think about delineating this. This is a severe enough situation where if someone goes off, it would probably lead to a serious crash or a fatality. So I'm going to look at least at delineation. I don't do nothing in this particular case because the risk is so great. But whether you shield this or delineate this really comes down to looking at a plan for your overall system. And if you are going to shield it, by the way, you can get away with a very light system. You can get away with a cable or a W rail system as long as you have the deflection distance. So you may have to remove a tree um, down there where there's that one tree near the car that's inside the deflection distance. But a rail system will actually protect the slope. The vehicle will go out midair and come right back in. Um, in terms of it being a lawsuit waiting to happen, it depends. We have lots of places where we've got steep slopes. It really comes down to have we done what we can, where we can with the risk that we are willing and able to take. Um, it is funny when you go out west, you see slopes like this all the time and they don't worry at all, they just delineate. <coughs> okay, what are we gonna do here? Possibly shield. Someone says remove, make it traversable possibly. Okay, yeah. Shielding the end of driveway is really, really tough um, because of the distance you need to build up that strength in the rail system. And that's actually one of the real problems we have on lake roads. I like the fact somebody said, look, remove those head walls. 
get that down to road height and maybe put in one of those culvert in sections so that a vehicle goes down that ditch, it's gonna go up and over the top. It's not perfect. There is no perfect solution, okay? But it does really help protect the vehicle if it did get trapped into that ditch. We definitely don't wanna leave that head wall. And as a minimum, short term, delineate it somehow, okay? I don't know if the little square with the front of the post is reflective or not, but yeah, some delineation would help, but yeah, we definitely wanna do, do more than nothing. Um, and again, I would probably look at trying to make it traversable because you can't remove the driveway. Um, and I'm not likely to fill that particular one in, but obviously we saw earlier that that was done in one case. Okay, what are we gonna do here? Gotta make it crash worthy. Okay. Yeah, you, you obviously have a bridge rail. You're not going to remove the bridge. You're not going to make it traversable. You can't relocate it. So yeah, you got to make it crash worthy, which means you really need the shield. You really need to have a proper shield with a proper rail system here, which means zero deflection at the bridge and an approach system that transitions from light to heavy. So in this particular case, you're going to have to do a little bit more. You can't just delineate this. And if you just delineate this, you are getting a lawsuit waiting to happen. You need to transition the shielding properly. And if you see these situations, these are places where you want to put some money. Um, and by the way, some of the new money from the uh, IIJA or bill can be used for safety improvements. So might be something you want to look into if it's an economic concern. Okay. What do we got here? What you guys think we're gonna do here? Remove, yeah, yeah, remove. I like remove actually. Possibly make it traversable, but certainly that head wall, you're gonna to have to do something. Whether you shield it, whether you remove it, whether you make it traversable, those concrete in sections are just risky things. You really want to cut them down or put approach systems into them. Okay, so good thinking. Again, set up a plan though. Don't just go pick one. Look at all of them. Okay. So what do we got here? Remove, make traversable, relocate, make crash worthy shield. And the uh, extra pin is a picture I'm going to show is actually the end of a culvert pipe. So let me go ahead and put the culvert pipe up. There's a small culvert pipe there. What are you going to do with that rail system? Your shield, delineate, shield. I would do more than nothing because there's a road there. There's a road on the other side of that rail system. Um, I don't know what it's protecting. There's a small trail, but really, that's a rail system that probably could just be removed. Um, there's really no need for that rail. That's well outside of a clear zone. That culvert is a good 20, 30 feet from the road. And there's actually a trail. If you're worried about protecting the trail, then you're gonna have to think something much longer because it's in a park area. So you might actually just be able to remove that one completely, okay? Got two more and then we'll let you go. See how y'all do on this one. You should remember this one and what happened here. This is the one. Yeah, remove the tree. The rail system's fine. So, you know, a good rail system that doesn't have uh, a good clear zone behind it is a real risky thing. So, yeah, cut that tree down. Okay. What are you going to do in this case of this mailbox? And look carefully at that mailbox. Note what it's supported by. Yeah, somebody said make crash worthy. Yeah, we can't get rid of mailboxes. They're, they're, they have a right to be on the roadway with some limitations, but we don't want something that's a fixed object. This is actually angle iron holding the two corners. Someone hits that and this is on a high speed roadway. They're gonna have a really, really bad day. They need to be crash worthy, okay? There are crash worthy, there are design standards for wooden post and for breakaway systems for our mailboxes. And uh, 
I did cheat a little bit. There is one last one in a ditch. You see an issue here? What would you do here? Might delineate it. Crashworthy of the ditch, is it too steep? If the ditch were shallow enough, then it might be fine. It might be okay to, not perfect, but the real problem here is the ditch got a little bit too deep. So when you drop off into it, that utility pole, do I need to move it? Um, well, that happens. Um, it obviously is tilting, but if it's far enough up the bank that it's not a hazard, you might do nothing. Yeah. And so, yeah, people's polls have frozen on a few of you, I know, but we're doing good because guess what? It's top of the hour and there's the last slide. So be safe out there. I'm a huge fan of rail systems, but I like to put rail systems up after I've looked at everything else. So if you're more interested in those things, let us know. But again, download the handout and go look at those references. They give you a lot more detail about when and where and how to use good guide rail systems. Everybody have yourself a great day. Stay safe and stay cool. Take care. Bye-bye.